Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm going to be going over what's been released from Larian, what lore I've discovered, and speculate as to what we might get to see in Baldur's Gate 3. The announcement trailer was released back in June. Overall, we see a short clip of a ruined city in the midst of a battle with focus on what this one particular Flaming Fist mercenary is going through, which is transforming into an illithid. Before I dig into my discoveries about everything involved with this clip, let's pick out a few things first that I noticed. There are flaming fist corpses everywhere, there are what seem to be lithids floating in the sky above the city, we have immediate evidence of transformation, there is a massive spelljammer ship above the city, which we will talk about here in a bit, and based on the context of everything, we can assume some sort of a lithid army is involved. The last two things I've noticed that stick out to me is the logo and the tabard on the guy transforming. Just as a brief pre-context, there are many different types of lithids that can exist, and I want to know which one this logo is representing because I don't immediately recognize it. Secondly, take notice at the mercenary's tabard pre-transformation and post-transformation. I'm guessing this is symbolism for everything going on, now, as powerful as the Flaming Fist are, and if you've ever pissed them off in the original games or even in a D&D session, you'd know that they're a force to be reckoned with, and seeing them in this state is kind of a big thing for the story. And as a brief explanation, the Flaming Fist Mercenary Company are a lawful neutral group who serve as the city guards for Baldur's Gate, and they promote order and will eventually become one of the greatest fighting forces in the 14th century, which so happens to be where Baldur's Gate 3 is supposed to be taking place in. So to put things into perspective, the original games take place roughly between 1368 and 1369 based on the timelines established, while the group itself was formed just 23 years prior to that. We know your character, who is canonically Abdel Adrian, ends up serving the company as their marshal after the events of Throne of Ball until he is killed in a short D&D campaign, Murder in Baldur's Gate, in 1479. So, just a little over 100 years, right? Wizards of the Coast has confirmed that Baldur's Gate 3 will take place 100 years after the events of the previous games, with the Descent into Avernus campaign being an almost immediate prequel to Baldur's Gate 3. So, it's possible we might get to see some connections from that as well. Now, with all of that in mind, based on an already established timeline, we can assume that the Flaming Fist would be roughly at the height of their full strength during the new game. So, thinking back on that symbolism, the Lithids are probably going to be immensely powerful if they can topple the Flaming Fist like this. And now that I think about it, Abdel is my first guess for a cameo in the new game. Depending on how Larian and Wizards want to plot the story, this could all happen right before or right after his death. And yes, he is still a ball spawn. He has that longevity. I suggest looking to both of those D&D campaigns if you're curious, because I just think D&D campaign stories are always good stuff. Now let's dig into everything we've discovered and learn a bit about our would-be antagonists. In general, the Lithid societies are hive minds under the control of an elder brain, which are an amalgamation of dead Lithid brains formed into one massive all-powerful brain. If you can imagine a giant brain bigger than your car, then you'd have a good idea of how big these things really are. Although Elithids are capable of individuality, the downfall of their ancient empires keep them voluntarily subjugated to an Elder Brain as the smart choice for their society. And usually when the Elder Brain controls an Elithid to do something, it can retain 100% control over them. In general, we know that Elithids are a race that mentally enslave other races to do their bidding, use psionic powers, communicate with telepathy, and of course, consume brains. The reason they live in the Underdark is purely because they dislike sunlight. It doesn't hurt them, they just don't like it. But their origins might have something to do with what we see in the first trailer. Mind Flayers aren't originally from a Baratorial the planet that D&D primarily takes place on. Their vast empires used to thrive in the Inner Plains and the Astral Sea. They traveled on ships called Spelljammers, specifically a Nautiloid, which is, of course, the massive ship we see in the first trailer in the sky above the city. 
the inner planes are spaces between the prime material world and the outer realms. The outer realms being places like Hell, the Abyss, Mount Celestia, Mechanis, and so on. And the Astral Sea is pretty much the space between spaces, you know, just outer space. The Illithids conquered worlds in pursuit of knowledge and supremacy over all life. They consumed the brains of every species they came across and subjugated them all at the same time. Now, the downfall of their massive empire was due to the Githyanki breaking free of their control and leading a massive slave uprising to just annihilate every Illithid they could find. As a result, what's left of their empire now hides in the Underdark. However, they still hunger for the knowledge they gain through consuming brains and still plot to take over the universe as they once did long ago. My guess is that Baldur's Gate 3 will be about the Illithids finally making their move to conquer Abir Toril and then reconquer the universe. There is one interesting piece of knowledge we learned from the Aboleths about the Illithids' origins. Aboleths pretty much retain all of the knowledge of the entire existence of their race to the point of remembering the creation of other species. The thing about that is they have absolutely no idea where the Illithids first came from. To them, they just showed up one day. There is an interesting theory about the Illithids escaping through time from an even greater conflict much further in the future than the Empire's downfall, but that's a speculation for a different day. So, reproduction. They are naturally genderless. They reproduce like some aquatic life and lay thousands of eggs at a time. Once hatched, the tap will spend about 10 years until maturity, just swimming in the brine pool of an elder brain. They're kind of vicious. Imagine a leech that can swim, but it has the attitude of a piranha. They're constantly fighting one another or being consumed by the elder brain if they're just dead or too weak. And by the way, the brine for the elder brain's pool is pretty much just liquefied dead elithids. Once they're ready, the tadpoles are normally inserted into one of the already enthralled slaves. They eat the host's brain, latch onto the remaining brainstem, and take control of the body and start the overall transformation into a full adult illithid. The illithids usually only want the strongest tadpoles becoming new illithids, and it usually takes 20 years after the transformation for that new illithid to reach its prime. But something tells me that won't be the case in the new game. There are a handful of races that can't be transformed due to pure physiology, being that the tadpole would die even attempting to transform them, and at the same time would waste a perfectly good slave for the illithids. Overall, most humanoid races are up for grabs. But further beyond that, tadpoles can transform other monsters into illithid-like creatures. Even growing in a brine pool untouched for a couple decades could allow for another monster that even the illithids fear. After all, they do fear that which they cannot control. There are a large number of illithid variants to the point of if you can guess it, then there might be an illithid variant of it. For example, vampire and lich illithids are possible, giant brain golems are possible, mind worms and even brain stealer dragons are possible. There are many more possibilities for variations. Some do require special means in order to create one, some sort of dark ritual or special catalyst. But aside from that, just put a tadpole in someone's eye and see what happens. With that in mind, there is a large list of monsters we can probably anticipate in Baldur's Gate 3 when we get into zones involving their communities and territories. And thankfully, not all of them possess high intelligence. One thing I am still curious about is the new logo we've been seeing. What kind of a lithid is that? At first, I wanted to assume it was some kind of mantle that the lithids like to wear around their uh, necks sometimes. But no, if you look at the cheekbones and see that they kind of continue on into the protrusions, I think this is some new type of mind flare, one that hasn't been introduced into the Forgotten Realms yet. My first guess is some type of demonic lithid, but other than that, I have no other clues for it. But we do know for certain that Illithids are resourceful and smart enough to make whatever creations they can think of. The Spelljammers, undoubtedly, there are a number of them left over sitting around in the Underdark. But originally, during the height of their empire, these things were everywhere, 
the Elithids are masters of traveling through the planes or even just zipping through empty space, and these ships are how they did it. As a generality, the helmsmen of a spelljammer can feel everything that happens to the ship, and nautiloids are usually operated by a team of mind-linked elithids. Now, these helms for the spelljammers have a limitation on how big of a ship can be controlled. So, thankfully for elithids, a more massive 200-ton ship can be controlled by a single elder brain. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the new game, we end up doing our final fight towards just something major at the top of one of those things. Overall, I speculate that what we're going to see in Baldur's Gate 3 is something to do with the ancient war between the Illithid and the Gith. Based on the first trailer from June, I'd say it looks like the Illithids are finally ready to make some kind of move towards their goal of universal domination, but given that their numbers have gone nearly extinct from the Gith hunting them, I'd say step one is to vastly increase their numbers and then just go from there. Thank you for sticking with me through this journey of speculation and lore. Next time, I will be going over the new trailer and gameplay footage that was released at PAX East. And for any of you who just love the lore of Forgotten Realms, you should check out the channel Mr. Rex. Out of all the articles, all the websites, all the lore videos, his content was a huge help when going down this rabbit hole trying to figure out what we might see in the new game. Until then, I hope you enjoyed it.